We do have time for questions. Um, if you have any that you'd like to pose right now, Dr. Bredesen is here. Um, and I will pass the mic. Hi, right now, if, if, if um, one goes into a physician for an annual physical exam, how many of these tests are the usual ones that are recommended, or do we have to ask for more specific ones? That is a great question. So how many of these tests are typical when you do your physical? It depends on who your doctor is. Some doctors will do zero of these. Some doctors will do about a quarter of them. Almost nobody will do all of these tests. And I think that's, again, that's the future. That's, I think that's what we need to tell them. So what I tell people is go and just give them this list and say, these are the things I want you to, to do. And, and some doctors will go ahead and do it. I just, by the way, I just talked last night um, at dinner with the, the guy who, who basically runs Kaiser for Southern California. And they're interested in the possibility of introducing this as a part of Kaiser so that you would be able then to get all these things. The issues, of course, are you know, how many tests are they going to do? What can they, have, what can they afford to do? So there are all sorts of issues there. But they realize that if they can keep people with good memory, keep people out of nursing homes, keep people from having Alzheimer's disease, that would make a huge impact on what, on, on the whole fiscal situation um, with the healthcare. So I think you know, the way of the future, as, as people have said for a while, is preventing going around now about a doctor who was doing research on her husband who had Alzheimer's with pure coconut oil. Yes. And some research is going on in Britain. Yes. Exactly. So coconut oil. So good point. So uh, guess what coconut oil does? I mentioned the ketones, which is what happens when you fast at night. So coconut oil has what's called median chain triglycerides that produce more ketones. So it fits exactly, essentially when you fast at night, you're doing what coconut oil does. And I think it's, it's fine. I usually suggest to people that they do add some coconut oil. It's a good thing. And the usual suggestion is um, it's fine to do uh, uh, olive oil and fine to do things that are, uh, that are cold pressed oils. You kind of want to minimize the ones where they've undergone a lot of heating. So what they're called seed oils. But coconut oil is something that is, as I said, medium chain triglycerides is a good thing. The problem I have with these things is every time someone comes out with one thing, they try to tell you that's the cure. And so, oh, this is the cure for Alzheimer's. Well, if you looked at the videos, you know, the guy got a little bit better. Uh, and not a lot. This guy was not you know, back to normal. So, yes, coconut oil is one of the things that's false. It's, it's absolutely fine. It's a reasonable thing to do. You're going to get some of an effect with if you eat correctly. But, yeah, adding coconut oil is fine. But don't expect it by itself. Have these concepts been in introduced or accepted by um, National Institute of Aging Alzheimer's centers um, that are funded by the government yeah, this is um, and private uh, Alzheimer's centers? Right, that's a great question. So I just actually was on the National Aging Council um, and I just finished my term on there. So I, I went to the, to the meetings and, and uh, so we, you know, the National Institute on Aging is aware of what we're doing. This is completely new. Nobody else in the world is doing anything like this. And they're not sure whether they want to put it in or not. So that's one of the reasons that we're doing these pilot clinical trials to show that, yes, indeed, this is the right way to go. But you're absolutely right. This is not accepted. It's, it's going to take some time for us to show that we can make people better. Nobody believes it yet. I'm under the impression that uh, coconut oil, I was told, is very bad for cholesterol, too. It's very bad to Well, you take. depends on how much you take. And, and, uh, you've got to obviously know what your cholesterol is. So yeah, you don't want to take a ton of it. And you do want to make sure that you know your HDL to LDL ratio. So there are, there are some of these things, you're right, that are trade-offs. But taking a small amount of coconut oil, for most people, Thank you. Let's have a couple more questions and then uh, give you a little break. <laughs> Thanks, Doctor. 
you showed us a couple of uh, examples where someone had a significant memory loss and someone was just recently diagnosed. Is there a point at which Applications. I'm sorry. Is there a point where these new applications um, are not going to be able to work, or should we try them with everyone? Yeah, this is a, an absolutely critical point, and we're trying to understand that right now. How late does this work? So I can tell you, you know, we've just started with the patients. Um, we've seen a number of them improve. The ones that have been the farthest so far that have clearly improved have been what we would call early Alzheimer's. Ones with, the ones with, as you go from the normalcy, the first thing is called SCI, which is a subjective cognitive impairment, where you feel that your memory is not what it was, but when you test it, it seems to be pretty normal. Then there's what's called MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment. When you test it, it's abnormal. But you can still do your job, you can still do most of it. That's what that woman had, basically, MCI. Pretty typical MCI. It was very much actually like the first man you saw. They're not yet all time. By definition, it's called Alzheimer's disease when it affects your activities of daily living. So when you have trouble driving, when you have trouble doing your job. So she was, you can see, she was getting to that point. But by definition, that's when MCI becomes Alzheimer's. Now, as you go on, as you know, you start losing that on any sort of typical testing. So we're now working with uh, the, the wife of a neuropsychiatrist with these tests we've given her tests over the years. And I told him, look, I, I don't know that we can do anything for someone who's so late, but he said, we want to do everything possible to keep her out of the nursing home. So I'm working with him actively, just talked to him on the phone today. I don't know yet whether we'll be able to help her. But if you think about it theoretically, the concern is, as long as you have the cells there, and you can potentially reconnect them, you're in good shape. Mm -hmm. When you get to the point where the cells are gone, uh, which occurs late in Alzheimer's, then it's going to be hard to imagine how we could help without actually adding something like stem cells. So the bottom line is we don't know yet. It's an incredibly important question. We think so far that we can help people all the way into the early Alzheimer's. Later than that, we don't know yet. One thing that is potentially helpful is when you start collecting these four peptides, they have chemical effects right on the synapses that are currently there. So even the synapses you have left are not working optimally. So those should be able to improve. And, and by the way, the one I mentioned that uh, is very far along, she can, one of the things that's amazing, she plays the piano. And she, although she doesn't even remember her maiden name, and she <coughs> has trouble if you tell her, can you put this fork in the drawer? She doesn't know how to do it. She is learning new music. And, and we're trying to understand She's clearly making new synapses. So she's able, she has a, a music teacher, and she's able to learn new things on the piano. It's not just remember, she was an excellent pianist before. It's not just that. She actually can form new connections. So why is it that she's able to form those new connections, learn new songs on the piano, and yet she can't remember what she had for breakfast? That's what we're trying to understand. So the bottom line is we don't know that. How long should you exercise exactly? And it used to be said, you know, if you could exercise three or four times a week, and some people now say, well, you should try to get it more like five or six times a week. But 30 minutes is good. So 30 minutes are over. You want to do enough time to get your heart rate up without hurting yourself. So one thing I always tell people is biological systems were not meant to function in square ways. You don't go from no exercise to an hour, because you'll hurt yourself get a heart attack or something like that. So do start slowly, move up, but when you then get to the top, you wanna to be at least 30 minutes and you wanna get your heart rate going. So, you know, 70% of max heart rate, you take 220, you subtract your age, that's your max heart rate, you can multiply that by 0.7. You want it to be in that range. So get it, you know, brisk exercise, uh, and for, yes, about 30 minutes, you know, if you can, five times a week or so. That actually is what's shown increase that DDNF and to help you to get better connections.
gonna have to stop questions now, but maybe Dr. Bredesen would stay and answer a couple that you just raised your hand. Wendy, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Masha, for being here too. Um, and please come outside, enjoy something uh, good for your brain, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you for coming today. And thank you, everybody.